everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast, and boy, do I have a treat for you today. So my guest today really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. So let me introduce you to Dave Hollis, who is a dad to four, a New York Times bestselling author, keynote speaker, podcast host, and life and business coach. He has worked as a CEO of a media startup, president of sales for the film studio at the Walt Disney Company, and talent manager across film, TV, and music. His purpose on this planet is to encourage people to step toward their calling while equipping them with the tools to lead an exceptional life. So Dave has a new book coming out soon called Built Through Courage, Face Your Fears to Live the Life You Were Meant For. And today we're going to talk all about fear and courage. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Renee. I'm so happy to be here. I'm psyched to have you here. And, you know, one of the questions that I had from uh, someone in my private Facebook group just a couple days ago was like, how do you deal with the fear? And please do an episode on this. And then we booked this. And I'm like, oh, I know exactly what we're going to talk about today. So you start off the first page of your book talking about how fear has dominated your life since childhood. So in in what way um, have you been able to turn that around and use it as power rather than as something that's holding you back? It's so crazy because in the beginning of my life, I was just like overwhelmed, like held captive in so many instances by my fear And it just takes, of course, like anyone who's listening is going to resonate with this. It takes experience in facing things that you had fear for and seeing, oh, it actually turned out in a way that I couldn't have expected. Or, wow, I grew in a way that I couldn't have hoped for to change a little bit of the way that you think about it in a really bizarre way. I mean, some of it ends up coming back to a little therapy that I've been doing in the last couple of years to really become more... Uh, comfortable with, but also to get to know myself better. Uh, The way that I have a relationship with my emotions is just so different now than it was even just a couple of years ago in that identifying that self, me, is in a relationship with my emotions, but I am not my emotions has been this huge breakthrough that has allowed me to see these things that I feel as parts that believe themselves to be doing work that they think is actually here to help me. And in seeing my fear as a, for example, as a part of me, but not me, lets me have a conversation with it to understand why it believes it has presented itself. And what's crazy, because I don't love fear, uh, more than anything in the last year and a half of my crazy chaotic life, I've actually come to see fear as an invitation. More often than not, when I find myself afraid of something, it now feels more than anything like a pull, like an invitation for me to step toward it because of what I know will be the benefits of equipping myself with courage to face it if I were to walk toward it. So um, fear fear is trouble only if you decide to allow it to be. Easier said than done, but the more often that you can dip your toe into a space that you have fear for, build some kind of inoculation over time for having faced it to train yourself to believe, oh, this is not as bad as I thought it might be. You find a way to change the relationship with it so that you can start walking toward it. So you said that this was a journey that you've been on in just the past couple of years. What was the switch for you? Well, in life, I think change is a constant. So all of us are going to experience change all the time, even if we don't like it necessarily. And I think there are two kinds of change. There's the change that we choose. We make a decision to make change or the change that chooses us, things that happen that we could not have expected, could be a diagnosis, a job loss, a relationship ending, whatever it ends up being. And I have been someone who has, in these last four years, really experienced both. I left a corporate environment where, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, I was the head of sales at the Walt Disney Company and chose to leave a thing that I was familiar with and had comfort in for the wild unknowns of entrepreneurship. And that choosing of change, as much as I had agency in the decision, it was still filled with uncomfortable and Uh, like getting my sea legs, as it were, out in the choppy waters of something that was new. 
Uh, but then I also experienced the end of a marriage yeah. in the last two years worth of time. And that change that chose me left me having to, in the aftermath of now that I'm no longer who I was, having to decide who I was going to be. And uh, for me, I mean, my primary identity was husband to Rachel. And so in a world where now I had to decide and work through who am I now uh, with this like future that I have in a blank piece of paper in so many ways, having been handed to me, there's this uh, exhilarating and terrifying thing that comes in getting to fill out what your future looks like now that it no longer looks as you would have thought it might. And so that has required courage to face the fears of the unknown and become comfortable with the uncomfortable of charting a new course. Uh, but in either respect, anytime you make the decision or have the decision made for you and experience change, it's going to require courage to fully take advantage of the benefits that come in facing the fear and becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable that exists outside of your normal. So where does the courage come from? Because so often a lot of my audience are divorced women or men going through a divorce or out on the other side or contemplating it. How do you find that courage when you're in the, the really the suck of it? Because let's face it, divorce sucks. I'm twice divorced. It all sucked. Um, and choosing to not stay in that place and choosing to walk away and walk kind of into the light. Like, how do you take that first step? Well, you do it at first slowly and with a lot of grace, because as much as I have a lot of appreciation for the good that ended up coming, I have gratitude for this thing that chose me and how I became who I've become in the aftermath of post-traumatic growth. Uh, as much as there was stress, there was a lot more growth. Uh, I became who I've become because of, not in spite of, the things that have happened. And so I have gratitude for it. But at the beginning, I did not have that vision for what was possible. At the beginning, one of the first casualties in my life after divorce was my imagination. I had a really hard time yeah. thinking about what next could look like since it was going to inevitably be so different from what I'd imagined. And so one of the first things that I did since we started with fear, I, I had to really make a relationship with fear and understand what my fear was. Like I made a list of 46 things that I, through streams of tears in the back of yeah. my house on a rock in nature, um, was just trying to connect with so that I could understand, like, what is it that I am afraid of in that, that's keeping me, that's acting currently as an inhibitor for me to cast a vision for what might be possible next. And the beauty in actually taking out of my subconscious into consciousness on a piece of paper, the things that I was afraid of, I was able to really create two columns. Hey, here are the things that are real. Here are the things that are ridiculous, right? There were plenty of things that I was afraid of that when I finally brought them into light, I was like, all right, come on. I've been through this kind of a scenario before. I've made sense of, out of the unsensible things. I've found ways to connect after things didn't go my way or learn from failure when something didn't work out the way I'd hoped. And so there were plenty of things. I'd say like 75% of things that I was able to make peace with and release. And there was a gift in just letting go of those things. But there still were plenty of things that were very real. I, I don't believe that fear is false evidence appearing real in all instances, there's plenty of things that were real. And what they begged was, how, Dave, might you create a plan so that in having a plan, you can face these fears, not in a way that makes them go away, but that equips you with the kind of courage that will be necessary to face them. I, I have described in the book this idea that we live on something of a, a safe harbor, our comfort zone. And when we are disrupted either in choosing change or change that chooses us, the first thing we have to do in leaving comfort is cross through a, a, a sea of fear that surrounds our comfort zone on all sides. It's like a moat. There is no drawbridge. The only way that we can get to the learning and the growth that exists on the other side is by walking right through it. And so the question that ends up being, all right, which of these fears are real and how might you equip yourself to handle facing those fears in a way that builds something more productive? 
for me, I could not, because of this compromised imagination, think about my life years from now. Like at the beginning of that crawling through the tunnel in Shawshank prison terms, I did not have a vision for that sequence in the rain at the end of that tunnel. I just knew I had to keep crawling. And so instead of thinking a year in advance or five years in advance of who I'd hoped to be now that I was no longer who I'd been, I was asking, what do I need to make progress in the next 90 days? Mm. And I was asking against the backdrop of the five dimensions of health, like what do I need in my mental, my emotional, my physical, my relational and my spiritual health? And if I could come up with two or three things in each of those dimensions that would just allow me to make progress. I wasn't looking to be fully healed or whole. I wasn't thinking that I was gonna somehow in 90 days be free from grief. It was gonna continue to be a journey. But if I could just make progress, I might be able to maintain some momentum because of the inertia that allowed me to keep going, to get closer to the other side, wherever the other side ended up being. And so by asking that question, on an every 30-day basis, I was now taking the context of the real-time situation that I was sitting in and asking, okay, I'm 30 days further along this journey than I was the last time I was here. What do I need for my mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, and relational health today? Can I now incorporate those things in my habits and my routines, address my coping mechanisms, have the right circle of people around me? guard what I'm consuming on a regular basis, you know, like all of the things that make up your every single day. And the things that I needed on the first time I asked that question were wildly different than yeah. the second and the third and the fourth. But by asking that question on a regular basis and being considerate of what I needed, it did allow me to make progress, which for me at the beginning was the most important thing because I didn't know where I was heading, to be honest. And I, and I, I was, you know, I think like anyone is pretty hard on myself for feeling as much as I was feeling until I could normalize my feeling because of some of the ways that my emotional and mental health needs were being satisfied with therapy or community from people that might make me feel normal and how I was feeling those things yeah. or the way that my spiritual practices were having me have conversations with God that were normalizing some of the things that I was feeling and allowing me to feel whole in a way that wouldn't have otherwise been allowed because of the way that I was feeling so bad about having lost something that was so important. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important, too, is that every step forward, you may have a couple steps back, especially going through something like a divorce. Like you don't just keep moving forward and never look back. Like I think that in that, at least, especially that first year, there's so many moments where you're looking back and you're if you're missing your kids, you're looking back. And if you're an anniversary comes up, you're looking back. And it's just recognizing that that's so normal. Oh, man, like I've described it as a nonlinear process, and it is so nonlinear in that at the beginning, you can have a good handful of hours before you have yeah. a bad hour, yeah. uh, right? Like I had a consecutive days of crying streak that yeah. would rival Cal Ripken. I mean, like I was just like, yeah. I was crying regularly. And then you hope that you get to a place where you're not crying every day, but yes. maybe every other day, and then not every week, but every other week. And to your point, you, you know, you like make progress, you start feeling good and then a birthday shows up yeah. or something ends up happening where you're reminded of not so much what was, but the idealized vision yeah. of what could have been that you wish would have been. Uh, I found so often in my grief journey that the thing I was grieving wasn't so much what existed, but what I wished would have existed or what yeah. like in a world where I could have manufactured the scenario would have allowed things to happen in a different kind of way. That wasn't real. Um, but even though it wasn't real, it didn't make that grief any less real because I did wish that things could have worked out differently. I did wish that we could have found a way to still be together. And yet here we are. Uh, but yeah. that grief was something that instead of like a, a younger, different version of me, I think would have tried to suppress those feelings would have tried to push them away or potentially mute them with alcohol or, or something else. And um, I think one of, the, one of the things that has been super productive for me and helpful for my four kids is honoring these feelings 
and recognizing that they have a place. Even those that don't feel great, um, they have a place. And sitting in them, sitting in that suck, experiencing it, doing everything you can in that experience to learn everything that you possibly can in a way that doesn't mute those things or try to push them away uh, was part of the beauty of how they yeah. became things that were for me and not happening to me in a, in a Tony Robbins-esque kind of uh, way. But I, I have an appreciation in part for uh, not having become who I am in spite of what happened, but because of what happened. And that yeah. in part was sitting in it, which, yeah, it sucks. I don't want anyone yeah. to ever get divorced literally ever. Mm -hmm. And yet, bizarrely, I can also hold in real time that I have gratitude yeah. for experiencing the pain that was, in fact, catalyzed into power. So let's talk about that. Now that you're out on the other side and you're past the tears and all of that, the, the suck and the muck of going through it, you came out. Did you ever imagine that you would be happy on the other side of this? Never. I, I mean, like, it's an, it's an unbelievable thing. I like I, uh, among other things, I journaled so much. I've never written so much in my entire life. I mean, I was on a deadline for a book, which was a miracle blessing in and of itself for the cathartic nature of having to process this in, in a way. But also, I just wrote every day, all the feelings. And every once in a while, I'll go back or I, I have a podcast myself and I would grab the podcast mic and just talk into that thing to no one but myself. It'll never air anywhere but for me. Mm -hmm. And I've gone back to listen and it it's just incredible that there were there was a time where I thought you'll never be happy again. Yeah. You'll never experience yeah. uh you know like freedom or feeling a, a certain way. You'll never and every one of those feelings was again like just fear speaking into my not being able to appreciate what was possible since I'd yeah. never been where I was and a lot of ego, yeah. uh, to be totally honest, right? Like in an environment where I probably would have fought for the rest of my life to stay in my marriage, I would have likely done so at the expense of who I was put on this planet to be, to like be super blunt. I am uh, a different person today than I was two years ago. And I have become that person in part because of a gift that was given to me by my ex-wife who could see something that I could not. And um, I can remember at the very beginning of our divorce, she'd written something uh, around the courage that it took to ask for the divorce. And I just like, I had such a triggered response to the yeah. idea that she was being create courageous because I was hurting so badly and I couldn't yeah possibly imagine that this was an act of courage. And I now, where I am today, have such an appreciation for it, of course, being this act of courage, that of course it took courage for her to make a choice that would change the dynamic of our family, but that also would create for each of us the best versions of ourselves yeah. and the best parents that our kids get to be the now beneficiaries of. And it's, it's wild that time is, of course, the thing that changes the way that I would think about that or, frankly, any other aspect of this experience um, in, a, in a wild way. At the very, very beginning of this journey, I had a conversation with my 99-year-old grandmother, Grandma Lee, and uh, I call, she called me. And she asked how things were going, and I said, uh, you know, they're both. I'm both sad and hopeful. I'm both grieving and inspired that this is going to turn into something good. Like it was both. And it was just this like very bizarre thing that I could hold both of these emotions at the same time. And this woman who had been literally like, you're 99, you have been through everything. She had been through everything as a single mom to five, buried two husbands, lost a son to cancer, a grandson by suicide. Like she's seen it all. And most of her friends at 99, they are gone. And so she said this thing that was just like so simple and so powerful. She said, look, I know this. I've been through a lot of very, very hard things. Yeah. And I didn't enjoy going through those hard things when I was going through them. But I can tell you this. I made it through every single hard thing that's ever been introduced to me in my life. And you, Dave, will get through this as well. And as much as you won't enjoy it while you're going through it, when you're on the other side, you'll have a heightened appreciation for your ability to get through hard things, which, of course, I now have. 
And unfortunately, at 46, since I'm not 99, I also have a wild sense of this reality. This isn't the last time I'm going to experience hard things in my life. And so I hope more than anything that the evidence that I now have of the power of having been through this hard thing, producing what after a decent amount of time proved to be a positive result, now changes the way that I jump to a conclusion at the beginning of my next hard thing that it's not going to turn out well. I think it's, you know, hopefully it's going to be, all right, what good can come from this? What, what am I going to, on the other side, be stronger for or more resilient because of having to go through this thing? And I think that's such a good point, being grateful for something. And people think you're crazy when you say, how can you be grateful for your divorce? And I'm like, I, you know, I, so I'm twice divorced, had all of the shame and all of that. I have an, a great co-parenting relationship with the son of my dad. My second marriage was the, I mean, it was as bad as bad could be. And I'm so grateful for it. I'm like, because there were so many yeah. lessons in that, that relationship too. And it's, it's getting out the other end and looking back and saying, wow, like, had I not gone through that, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. I wouldn't be sitting here or having the conversations or the perspective or the ability to like realize that every day can be a really, really great, awesome day. And you have the power to control that. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a thing that, again, I, I remember at the beginning, the end of 2019, I made this like now seemingly ridiculously bold proclamation that 2020 was going to be my best year ever. Mm. <laughs> I did it at the uh, company holiday party at a DJ booth where we were all gathered and uh, made sure everyone knew that I'd saved my best year for my 45th year on this planet. <laughs> I was going to have the best 2020 ever. And what I didn't appreciate in the proclamation was that I didn't get a say in the conditions through which my best year would materialize. Ah, interesting. Because as it turned out, my best year, my most important year, arguably of my life, and the one that I will at the end of my life look back on, as informing so much of who I ultimately became and the legacy I left on this planet was born in so many ways in 2020. My best year, most important year ever, also happened to be by a landslide, my hardest year ever. And it didn't become my best or most important in spite of the things that happened, but because of those things. And so I have this appreciation for post-traumatic growth, the kind of things that can happen in the midst of handling hard things or seeing hard things in a way that I think hopefully changes the way that I think about walking towards hard things because of what I now have, again, a, a set of evidence of how good can come from hard. Yeah. You say in your book that a ship in harbor is safe, but ships weren't built for safe. What do you mean by that? Well, it's uh, it's been a mantra of mine. It's, a, it's actually tattooed right here on my arm. I mean, disregard the mosquito bite. But uh, <laughs> I have... Uh, I have for the last handful of years had this line, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. It's a John Shedd quote. And it's just this idea. It's a reminder uh, for me and even to my kids that I was built to handle the choppy waters that exist outside of my own safe harbor. Mm -hmm. That as much as it will be scary and I will be fear filled at times as I leave something I know for something I need that I have already inside of me the things that are necessary to handle the choppy waters where I can grow. Mm. And I, I can tell from uh, every time and any time that I've been stuck in my life, the consistent variable that was present in my stuck was not growing. I, I found yeah. myself in a place where I'd become okay just being okay or comfortable yeah. being comfortable and so I know if I'm interested in pursuing purpose, if I'm interested in living into my calling, or as I say, like each of us was put here for a very specific reason. I just believe it in my bones. And so there's a mandate of sorts that then comes with that recognition that we every day have to honor the intention of our creator. Well, what does that mean for me? I mean, most days it means that I'm going to have to wade into something that I haven't done before in a space that I'm likely to fail at so that I can learn through that failure. And I have to just remind myself that I was built for this. I was built as a ship yeah. to handle the choppy waters, that as much as it is, of course, safer to stay in the harbor, that's not why I'm here. And I want to encourage anyone who's listening to believe you were built for this too. You have to believe that you were built for the calling that your intuition has been begging you to sit up and pay attention to 
even if it and as it makes you uncomfortable and even by the way as a departure from who you've been makes the people who you've historically made comfortable because of how you've usually shown up feel uncomfortable mm. as you now step into this space. So how do you address that? How do you address showing up in a different way? You're doing the work, you, you're doing the personal development and you're saying, okay, here's the, here's a different version of me and people around you don't know how to respond. So what do you do? You do it anyway. Uh, you know, like the simplest thing that I could say, like one of the most important questions that I've asked over this last couple of years is how do I feel about myself when I'm by myself? Mm. It's a big yeah. question. Yeah. But if you can ask the question, how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself? You know that there are times when you feel great and times when you don't feel great. I actually, when I made that declaration in 2019, I went on a couple of day retreat out on a rock in Tucson, Arizona without technology to write in a notebook. How do I manufacture my best year ever? And in that, in that space, I looked at the five trailing years at where I didn't feel great about myself when I was by myself to see if anything was consistently present so that I could preemptively get ahead of it in 2020 as I manufactured this great year. And the thing that was present, anytime I didn't feel great about myself, anytime I felt stuck, anytime I had confidence issues was that I was out of integrity. There was dissonance in my life in that I knew that I had either made promises to myself about a certain way I wanted to be I'm going to do these things. I'm going to have these habits. I'm going to do this routine. I'm going to, I made commitments to myself more importantly than even to other people. And at the end of the day, knew that I didn't keep my word to myself. Hmm. And so the, the, the answer to how I feel best about myself when I'm by myself is when I'm able to close that gap. Cause the gap, anytime I don't keep those promises, anytime I represent to the outside world that things are great when I'm struggling, anytime I have, you know, in any way created dissonance between who I could have been and how I actually showed up, that space is where a lack of confidence and shame and self-loathing and the yeah. lack of motivation, all those things thrive inside of that dark space. And so closing that gap and creating integrity is the answer for me on an every single day basis. And I'll, I'll argue that's the answer for anyone. So um, if you can, to the extent that you have a handle on who you'd hope to be or how you know yourself to have a certain set of skills or um, the way that you want to live your life so that you could honor the intention of your creator and then make a plan, make the, here's the routine and the habits and the circle and the coping mechanisms that are necessary to allow that alignment to take place. That's when you're going to feel great. Yeah. And that's hard to do because a lot of people, most people aren't comfortable just being by themselves. And even like post-divorce, it's it, there's a lot of people who will rush to jump into something else because they haven't quite healed or they haven't they haven't sat with their own feelings and they're trying to kind of mask or put a Band-Aid over how they're really feeling. So what you're suggesting is really, really difficult work. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like it's hard to sit in your own thoughts it's hard to spend time with your feelings. I had the benefit of spending a decent amount of time in therapy after my divorce. I, I, I had been in traditional therapy for a long, long time, but my identity was so rocked because husband to Rachel was such an anchor of how I might identify myself. So I found a therapist that specialized in something called internal family systems. It's a kind of a study of self. And it was this very important work to understand that I, as self, am the observer of my thoughts and my feelings. I am not my thoughts or my yeah. feelings in a very kind of un untethered soul kind of way, if you've read that book. But there's, there's beauty in being able to differentiate who I am as the observer of those things versus being those things, because I was just being flooded by so many feelings, overwhelming feelings that I'd never experienced before. And so um, the willingness to sit in peace or in space that said, all right, come on in, in, in like inundate me, if you will, with the things that I'm thinking or feeling and have yeah. those things now pour out in journaling or in therapy as a, as an ability now with this help from a therapist to say, all right, what role do you think you are playing here? Yeah. Anxiety or fear 
or anger or whatever it might be. I was given a gift in now disassociating myself from being those feelings and now creating a relationship with what those feelings were trying to tell me. So your new book called Built Through Courage, Face Your Fears to Live the Life You Were Meant For, was that the book that you had set out to write when you started writing? I, well, it's crazy because I did have the the outline. I did have the general idea. I didn't have the content as it ended up unfolding. So like the book itself um, and the, the timing of the deadline was a gift, an unbelievable gift in that there was something so cathartic in being able to take all of the emotion and all the things I was, I mean, I wrote reams in journaling uh, notebooks that never will see the light of day, but to be able to tap into those emotions and be able to tap into the way that those experiences now show up inside of the book was a gift. It's, it's wild. One of the first things I wrote, I wrote it in March of 2020, was in the rush to return to normal, let's use this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. Mm. Right. So it was a little bit of a nod to this pandemic life that we were showing up in. It was a suggestion in this thing that I was writing of getting a sense of why you're here and where you want to go and what it's going to take to get there. Like that, were, those were the bones. But what I couldn't have anticipated was that just two months after writing those words, I would have a conversation. You know, we had a very short window of time that we talked about divorce. I mean, it was a, like a five day window that I just didn't expect. And in that window showing up, I now was in a place to have to inventory what of what had been part of my normal would now be part of a new normal in a way that I could have never expected. But yeah. um, I think the beauty of the timing of the book and the writing as much as, yeah, I talk about the divorce, but I don't get into like detail, detail, that the emotion of what ends up being the experience of anyone who's yeah. experienced change or discomfort grief and healing. Uh, I think it all comes through in the pages. And so, um, I, again, I just, I, I'm so grateful for the serendipity or providence that was the timing of needing to turn in a book and the wildest season of my entire yeah. life. And, and, you know, I like that you said that it, you don't talk about the details because the details don't matter. Like, and that's what people don't realize. I say it all the time. It doesn't matter. Like none of that, what's on that piece of paper, it doesn't, none of it matters. It matters what you decide to do after and how you change your mindset and how you do the work and how you own your own shit too, which is part of it. So I love that. Um, the book comes out October 26th, right? It does. All right. It's tell me. like nearly here. I'm freaking out. I mean, in a, like the best kind of way after a very long career, this is easily the thing I am proudest of, of anything I've ever worked on. So I'm excited for people to read it. And I'm also, as I've been having conversations with people like yourself, people are reading the book in real time. It's like, oh, I forget that you create something for it to be read. It's now triggering all of my creator anxiety of like, I hope I know, you right? like it. I hope it serves <laughs> you as well as I want it to. <laughs> It's hard. Writing a book is damn hard. It is hard work. And, you know, we're, because I'm a writer too. It's like, you don't, you want someone to read it and then you don't want them to read it. And it's like, you're pulling the pages yeah. back, but you can't pull the pages back. It's coming out in the world. You can There's no pulling anything back at this point. I'm so excited. No, that's awesome. So uh, tell me about the pre-order because you get some bonuses and some special gifts if you pre-order the book before it actually drops on the 26th of October. Oh, yes, Renee. Good call. Uh, so I had asked the team, hey, if we want to ask someone to spend 20 bucks, their hard earned money or maybe 15. Uh, could we give them like 500 bucks worth of goodies? And the answer was yes. So if you head over to MrDaveHollis.com forward slash book, there is immediately a course on finding your purpose. It's a four part course with a PDF workbook. There's a course on confidence and mindset, two things you will need in uh, the pursuit of anything that is worth pursuing. And then you get uh, immediate access to 13 weeks worth of coaching. There's just a couple of live coaching sessions that are left. But in our uh, online community, our private Facebook community, there's about 6,500 humans, good people in this community, like-mindedly looking at how they can live their best life. Uh, you get jumped into that crew, get access forever and ever to the previous 11 coaching sessions that already wow. exist and can join us for the last couple of Mondays. 
Um, there's some other fun stuff. We do weekly giveaways, but uh, I would love for anyone who is uh, on the fence from grabbing a book to uh, ju jump in and take advantage of these uh, these goodies. I I've had so much positive feedback from people who've done the Finding Your Why course and, and the Confidence Mindset course as well. It's so. major value because usually you buy the book and that's what you get is the book, which is amazing in and of itself. But now you're getting all of these extra things. So I'll put those that link in there as well. I just ordered my book. It's super simple to do. You go onto your website, you order through Amazon, you plug in your order number and you are good to go. So Dave, final, awesome. final question for you. What is the last thing that you have done or something you've done lately that has really like scared the shit out of you, but you did it anyway? Uh, I mean, I'm doing something in real time. I mean, the last thing I did, I, uh, I put myself into a triathlon, which I would love to say, having uh, crossed the finish line, I'd love to say that it was just all about, like unicorns and, and magic, but <laughs> I did not prepare for the open water swim in a way that required I needed some help to get through the open water swim. I thought I was going to drown after I got to, a little kick to the face in the midst oh, of this no. open water swim. Um, so that was one, but I am in real time doing something that is ridiculous in, uh, I've never been here before. Uh, I'm in a uh, relationship with a human named Heidi, who is a professional fitness human, among other things. And uh, because of the way that she has seen something in me, I've now seen something in myself. I am going to, in February, be on stage for a physique Woo! bodybuilding competition and uh, that is not a thing I ever thought would come out of my mouth. It definitely scares the everything out of me. And yet yeah. I'm going to do it anyway, in part because it scares everything out of me. That, so, that's amazing. That. I mean, the prep that goes into that is just incredible. That's awesome. So good for you. Thank you. Make sure you, make sure you post those pictures online. <laughs> oh, we will. Don't you worry. We dipped in uh, all the tanning oil. It's going to be on. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, they can tan and contour, you know. They can add some abs on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can you throw some abs in here, please? Thank yep. you. <laughs> Dave, such a pleasure. I so appreciate you taking the time. And um, I I'm, I'm, can't wait to read your book and um, dive into this. I'm going to encourage everyone else to read it and pick it up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate you and the work you do. Keep going. Let me know when this comes out so I can let everyone know. I, uh, I appreciate you, audience, for giving this a listen. Absolutely.